continue on with our Bible study. We heard a good message emphasizing a very important matter, and that is remember. So I'm going to use the word remember right now to say, I hope you remember what we studied last week. We read the whole first chapter of First John because we were wanting to set out our, our study of the biblical doctrine of uh, fellowship. And I said we would primarily be looking at verses 3 through 10 of First John. But we read the whole chapter. And then we spent the remainder of the time noticing about that which we become even a greater trouble in the church is it apostatized various ways after the first century, but that is uh, the matter of Gnosticism. Uh, we won't go back over all that, but I would say this. When a false doctrine is being formed, it may go for quite a while as it influences people and other people refine it in the way that they think about it and continue to teach it. And a schism comes along and so forth. Then finally, somebody gives it a name. So when John is dealing with what he does in the gospel of John, as well as this first epistle of John, and I think we can safely say the second and third epistle, but especially the first, he has the early beginnings of Gnosticism in mind. Now, remember the general idea of them calling themselves, or they became to be called Gnostics, was that they claimed they were superior in knowledge. In this case, it was superior knowledge concerning Christ. And we won't go back over that again, except to say that some way or the other, the devil is always striving to cause us not to really believe in Christ as he really is. What I mean by that, as the Bible presents him, what I mean by it. He's uh, always trying to get us to be mean, to undermine, to believe a lie regarding God and Christ or anything else pertaining to the will of Christ. Now, we want to particularly emphasize what John said to remind ourselves in verse 1 of what we're trying to do, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, the second uh, verse, you'll notice, is a parenthetical expression. A parenthetical expression is set in beside the main thought with the idea of clarifying. Now, what's interesting about all parenthetical expressions is that you can leave them out, and if you didn't know they're there in the first place, you will never miss them. Let me show you. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, their hands have handled of the word of life, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I left out the second verse. You wouldn't know it unless you had your Bible and you could see it's there. But when you do read verse 2, you will see that he's engaged in further clarification regarding the uh, verse 1 and verse 2. But these are verse three. These um, these verses, especially verses one and two, are actually setting the the context of the rest of it, and of course, for quite on uh, a bit of ground on into the the epistle. But now remember too, he wrote this to Christians. John does not have to convince them that God exists, that God is the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He does not have to convince them of what he writes about in the Gospel of John. He does not have to teach them the plan of salvation or the church and its work, its organization, and its worship, and its mission, and its purpose. They know all of that. I think sometimes we fail to understand that when we emphasize 
that most of the New Testament is written to Christians, keep them faithful. He's concerned about them keeping the proper understanding of Christ and the fellowship that he and the other apostles had with Christ and wanting then the brethren to have that fellowship. And we'll have more to say about that later on. So that's what is um, is set out here in these first two verses, the second being a parenthetical expression. Um, in verse 3, he says, That which was seen and heard declare we unto you. Now the we there means the apostles. They all taught the same thing. That's why it can be called the apostles' doctrine, singular. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. One te didn't teach one thing, and then another teach completely contrary to it, contradictory to it. He says, that which we have seen, seen with what? Well, they're in the flesh. They see with their eyes. So they've seen. Well, he makes that point back in verse 1. He says, we have seen with our eyes. We have looked up on. All right, that which we have seen and heard, so they heard him with their ears, like you're hearing me and I hear you when we speak. So what does he say? He says that you may also have the fellowship with us. Now look at that again. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. That is us, the apostles and God. Now, this has been said, and I think most of us know it, but I'll use that word remember again. Fellowship, we get concerned about fellowship, first of all. We'll have more to say about its meaning later. When it comes to my fellowship being restored with God, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 tells me that by sin, I was separated from God. I didn't have any fellowship with him. I lost it by sinning. We spent some time at the beginning of this class uh, about Adam and Eve and sin they committed and how sin came to the world, so on. Well, a man lost fellowship with God. And we, when we're born into this world, live innocent for a while, but then we reach a stage where we know we are accountable to God for our actions, and the Bible tells us we sin. We transgress God's law. Sins of omission or commission. 1 John 3, 4. James 4, 17. Thus we're separated from God. So what we had with God when we were born and yet innocent, not accountable for our actions to him, we lose. And then it's restored, but it's restored only in a certain way. These people, these brethren in the first century had fellowship with God. But you see, they could use it. They could lose it. Let me say again, they could lose it if they didn't continue in the doctrine of Christ. Now that gets in the second job. So doctrine's important. You can't have fellowship with God that John's talking about. If you don't have the right kind of doctrine, you're believing and practicing. If you're believing and practicing the doctrine that puts you in fellowship with God, then if you cease to practice the doctrine that puts you into fellowship with God, then you're going to lose that fellowship. And thus we talk about hearing child, children of God needing to repent, brought to repentance, confession of sin, prayer, so, on. so we see that he is talking about everybody who's a member of the church of our Lord, being able to have fellowship, and he wants to write to them and say, here's how it's done. Let me read it again. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Without proper understanding of that, the people who originally received this would know what's going on. 
they must have perked up being that they were Christians when they got this epistle from John and said, well, what's going on? We were added to the church. We were baptized to Christ. And uh, we worship him correctly as the Lord wants. And we continue steadfastly in the doctrine of Christ. Well, why is he writing this? Look at verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Let me start back now with verse 3 and bring it up as far as we can. Uh, with verse 3, John's returning really to the central thought as expressed in verse 1. And what is that? We declare an eternal being, a being that has no beginning or ending, that was known and seen by us. Now, in this verse, he gives emphasis to the fact that this eternal being is declared through the gospel message. Think for a minute. Church is commissioned to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. Why? Paul tells us. The gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. And it's explained a little further in fundamental ways in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And Paul writes that, uh, those verses, to them, reminding them of what they did, what they believed and did in becoming Christians. Now, the purpose of this declaration of John's, and here we get back to what Kim was talking about, is to remind Christians that this thing the apostles of Christ have, we also, as children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, we also possess. What is it? It is this, whatever fellowship is, fellowship with the deity, through our scriptural belief in, obedience to, and continuation in the gospel system, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said that plainly to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, that we're to continue steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, John tells us already in 1 John, um, or rather Ephesians 1 and verse 3, that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. And when you look later on down in this, in this chapter, 1 John verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The verbs there, things with us from all sin is a present tense verb. Greek, that's linear action. You keep on doing God's will and you stay in the fellowship. And the blood continues to flow, to make up, to continue to cleanse you from your sins. We're mindful of the need of this because we're taught plainly in this same book that we're not ever to think we reach a stage to where we won't commit sin. I might pause here and emphasize this part. There is a big difference in the way the, that God looks at a person he calls a sinner. A sinner used in the Bible is one who is practicing sin habitually, doesn't think anything about it, just like most people we know. But the child of God doesn't do that. It is incorrect. It is contrary to the scriptures. It's not speaking as the oracles of God for us to think of ourselves as sinners. Unless we are. But that does rule out the fact that we sin from time to time. Sins of human weakness. Sins of ignorance. Well, we've all been in that boat, unless anybody wants to claim that, well, I know all there is to know about the Bible, and I live it perfectly. I don't think anybody's willing to do that. So what makes up the difference? We walk in the light as he is the light. We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's a big difference in the person who doesn't care about God or 
doesn't is not interested in the truth. He just lives when he wants to live. He lives in sin outside of Christ, doing as he pleases, not bothered at all. And the child of God who's recognized those things, recognized his lost condition, out of a contrite, honest heart, hears and understands, believes the gospel, realizes that repentance is resolving his life from here on out. I'm going to obey God, let come what may, the best of my ability. And then confesses Christ, is baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. Thus, as a member of the church, he's in the place where all spiritual blessings are. Well, guess what? By doing that, he's now in fellowship with God. And he can't let any other thing cause him to lose that fellowship with God. But what keeps us going on since from time to time we sin, the Bible says plainly, and he does here. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and, truth, and his word's not in us. So we do sin from time to time. We'll have a thought cross our mind contrary to the will of God. Doesn't mean that we're happy with it. We're going to continue to meditate on it. And we're going to try to think more of it. No, it means that we strive against it. We fight the fight faith. And thus the blood cleanses us from our sins as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the whole idea, Matthew 6, 33. And that needs to be understood in any study of the biblical doctrine of fellowship. Now, as we go further with this, the fellowship Christians have or possess or enjoy with the Father and the Son causes the very oneness or unity for which our Lord prayed. And Paul commanded, 1 Corinthians 1, 10. And that prayer, of course, of our Lord is recorded in John 17. Therefore, conclusion, without this fellowship, this oneness or unity between men and God, there can be no fellowship or unity between and among men. There's our Fellowship between God and man being considered first. Vertical fellowship, you want to call it that. So it's recorded in other words of the sacred writings. Just as we stated it. And John's doing the same thing right here. So men must respect the authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with the whole heart, W-H-O-L-E, heart, comply with its mandates and principles. If fellowship, this unity, is to obtain and continue between God and men and with men who are in fellowship with God and other men who are in fellowship with God. Now, that's one of the reasons we quote such passages, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 all the time. It's talking about the importance of having the authority of Jesus Christ behind what we believe and what we practice. And if we don't have that authority, we're not in fellowship with him. And we can't be in fellowship with others who don't abide by his authority. Thus, by implication, we're seeing the importance importance of understanding how the Bible authorizes and what we do to ascertain that authority of our Lord. That's our responsibility. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to do you. That's present tense verbs. Don't ever stop doing it. If you don't ever stop doing it, Jesus says, then it'll be open and you'll receive what you want. But it, there's a continuous knocking. Never stops knocking. And that's what we sometimes fail to see, is that it's not that we ask once and we didn't get the answer, so leave it alone if you didn't ask me now. No, it's a continual seeking, continual looking. Doesn't mean that you can't learn the truth. It just means that to find any given truth, there must be that hungering and thirsting after righteousness. 
that pursuit of righteousness. You don't accidentally go to heaven. And that's the point being made. You have to want to and then know how to put that want to to good use. We leave verse 3, and we see, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And that's where we quit reading just a little bit ago in verse 4. It should be noted that while in verses 1 and 3, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is emphasized. But here in this verse, verse 4, emphasis is given to the importance of John's letter to these Christians. Now, remember, he's not writing them to tell them how to become Christians. He's not writing them about the organization of the church, the work of the church. He's not doing that. They know that, but he's concerned about them believing a false doctrine about Jesus Christ. Because if they do believe it, they're going to lose the fellowship that they have with John and the rest of the apostles and God himself. Now, the information that's revealed in the meaning of the words of John's epistle is for what? To create joy. That's the purpose of it. Just look at it again. These things write we unto you. Why do you write these things unto us, John? Why do we have all this information? that your joy may be full. Now, when you consider all that the apostles went through in the way of persecution and faithful members of the early church, what was done to them in terrible ways, how in the world will they keep any joy of anything regarding Christianity? But one of the simplest ways to note is that they did not look for deliverance in this world. They looked for a new heavens and a new earth. Thus, Paul could say that, I believe that Romans 8, 24, that we are saved by hope. Well, you won't even understand that if you don't read your Bible and know what God said. And you won't have the joy. It won't be as full as it can be if you don't understand that and many other things for that matter. So in this case, while it's true that the whole world is filled with wickedness, this letter reminds all of us, as it did them originally, that we have a saved, reconciled, justified, father and child relationship with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We have the expectation of life eternal life in heaven. And we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now that's one way or the other talk. You look at a little later on in First John, you'll see in First John 5, verse 19. We remember in our study of Hebrews, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And so many other places. So what we sh should we conclude? Well, no matter the hardship, no matter the pain, no matter the anguish, no matter the shame, whatever kind of persecution may come upon us, because we love the truth and obey it, because we're faithful to God, because we walk in the light as he is in the light, and have fellowship with God, then we know that glory awaits us in the life to come. And we may say which glorious life comes closer day by day. Now, we're just about to the end of time, so I'll pause here a couple of minutes before uh, to remind you that if you have any questions while I go through this, feel free to write them down. But as we close, let's close with this prayer to our Father. Would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we could be together. We're thankful for the technology that allows us to do so in the midst of this busy week. Study thy word, hear a message from thy word. 
to be caused to think about spiritual matters in a very materialistic world. Help us to enjoy, to appreciate, to be thankful for the fellowship that's being granted us through the gospel, our belief and obedience to it, to be with thee. Help us to understand it more and help us to study the scriptures to have our joy full that we will persevere in this world, fight the fight of faith, and lay hold on eternal life. Guide us on through the night, be with the sick, the afflicted, the orphans and widows. Help us to be ready to help all who need our help. Help us put our trust in thee and obedience to the truth. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.